100% as usual <laughs> alhamdulillah so um, from what i understand you sheikh we're just going to ask you this segment is called getting to know sheikh kamal makki up close and personal so i'm going to ask you a lot of uh, personal questions inshallah and um, you can answer them however you feel comfortable inshallah just so, be careful just so <laughs> inshallah so one thing i just I, I just heard from you right now which was was really uh, interesting to me i think a lot of the youth are interested in that was the fact that you mentioned that you used to be a DJ before? No. No. Teacher. A teacher. I thought you <laughs> a DJ. <Okay. laughs> so you used to be a teacher, mashallah. Yes, so you're yes. used to dealing with students. Okay, so just a couple of questions for you, inshallah. The first question I had was, besides teaching and going around lecturing and all that sort of stuff and speaking engagements, what do you like to do aside from that? People want to know. What is, what is Sheikh Kamal into? Like? Uh, as in hobbies? Anything. Hobbies, sure. Okay, hobbies, uh, I do uh, oil painting. Inshallah. I'm not making, I'm not joking here. Somebody's laughing. <laughs> I do oil painting. I draw. I like uh, aquatic fish. And uh, I like uh, cats. Inshallah. And uh, I mean, for, that's it. Do you yeah. play any sports? No, I, I've never been any good at any sport that has uh, a ball in it or something you have to chase around. So I never had good coordination. And it's weird that I, I wasn't the sports guy, but I was not the nerd either. You know, I was kind of uh, in between. So the only sport that I really uh, like became very good at, and I'm sure by looking at me you can tell, is I used to do a lot of bodybuilding in the, in, in the good old days. Now the only proof I have of that is this old photo, but the problem is that everybody who looks at it thinks it's photoshopped. You know? But it's not. It's not for shop. I don't have to impress anybody. <laughs> Mashallah. Yeah. So bodybuilding. So what motivated you to actually go out and seek knowledge? I know a lot of the youth are interested in this. What, what was it for you personally? Is there a story behind it? Or what exactly was it that led you to this decision? Okay, well, I don't have any fancy story. It's basically I was just pushed into it, you know. Because in North America, there's like a shortage of, uh, of speakers and so you're forced to give a khutbah, then you're forced to give a halaqa and then, and then as you're forced to speak you have to prepare for many hours and so you're forced to seek knowledge. So I think in all fairness I was forced into it because there was shortage. That's the only reason. That's a, I know, okay, so the question is a lot of us are forced into it in our situation. A lot of youth, mashallah, they want to get to that stage where they want to um, learn knowledge and th they're stuck in, well not stuck in, but a lot of them don't have the opportunity to go outside in Medina or Umm al-Qura even though they wish to. What advice do you have for them living in North America? What can they do, um, something you might have done or something that you suggest to them that they could do to be on the same, you know, the same level inshallah? Right. Well, you know, this whole Medina thing, um, yeah, and of course we all know the benefits of that, but that's not the only way to gain knowledge. And there are many people who are, let's just call them, homegrown speakers here, who, mashallah, have fantastic knowledge, because they really had effort, they put effort into it, you know. Uh, there are many people uh, who, you know, put all the effort into it, they memorized, they studied, and they ran after mashayikh, and they chased after it, and they didn't chase after video games and other things, and then they reached that level. Now, if knowledge was something that was not attainable and you have to travel overseas to, to get it, then that would be a problem. But out of the mercy of Allah, that's something you can do here as well. And there's so many knowledgeable mashaykh. Just now in Toronto, there's so many knowledgeable mashaykh. But I guarantee you, Abdul Wahid, when they have a class, they're probably like, you know, 15, you know, 12 serious brothers. And everyone else is just waiting for the, the bit to get up accepted into Medina. So you don't have to do that. If you put effort, some, a lot of fantastic speakers came out of it with, with excellent uh, yani knowledge and they chased after the ulama and the scholars and the, and the knowledgeable people. And it's not necessary that... Uh, necessary that they have to go. Right. Inshallah. That's very interesting. Um, now I'm going to get into your formal uh, introduction, inshallah. Um, so we'll just read uh, what we have down here is... Um, Sheikh Kamal Makki is a young, dynamic speaker and lecturer. I used to be young, used sorry. Used to be young, yeah. back in the body. Not anymore. Days. <laughs> Mashallah. So, Sheikh Kamal, as you can tell, is a young, used to be young, like you said, but he's still young. Mashallah. Young at heart. Dynamic speaker and lecturer who dedicated his time and effort into educating people uh, through his various talks. He teaches a number of, um, a number of youth and also specializes in the field of Islamic history. Mashallah. 
the most uh, famous of his talks and his vibrant da'wah workshop called How to Give Shahada in 10 Minutes, um, which has led hundreds to Islam. And uh, mashallah, it's a very good uh, talk. I would highly suggest everyone listens to it. Currently, he's the imam at uh, the Islamic Information Society of Calgary, where he dedicates his time in coordinating programs for the youth and creating a supportive environment for non-Muslims. He also teaches various courses designed especially for the youth growing up in the West. Uh, mashallah, that's the uh, introduction to the Sheikh. I would highly suggest listening to the current talk that he's going to talk about, which is hiding your pride. And oh, it's patience. <laughs> so the pride one, inshallah, he'll talk uh, tomorrow. He's going to talk about patience today, inshallah. So uh, without further, further ado, inshallah, if we could have everyone give your attentions to Sheikh Kamal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-ameen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. First of all, I want to begin by saying that I'm very, very, very pleased to be here. Because everybody knows and uh, everywhere I go, I make sure that everyone knows that my favorite conference in the world is the one organized by Masjid Khalid bin Walid. No takbirs? Thank you. So this is absolutely my favorite conference and I uh, usually don't miss it. I did have to miss it last year because I had a conference in Australia at the same exact time. And as we speak, the conference is going on in Australia. I was supposed to be there, but I apologize to them because I love this conference so much. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, so, I mean, it's always an honor for me to come to this conference. Uh, I always love being around the Somali people. I consider them the, the second best people in the world, right after the Sudanese people. <laughs> I'm sorry, was that funny? And just to show you how much I love you guys, I have two jokes for you. Yes, absolutely. The first one is for the sisters. Sisters, did you hear the joke about the foolish sister who said no? There you go. Okay. All right, calm down, calm down. Now obviously, obviously that was for the younger sisters, of course. Now for the brothers, a joke. How do you keep an ugly person in suspense? I'll tell you later. Okay. All right, calm down, please. Calm down. It's all about love, right? All right, people, let's start with our lecture about patience, inshallah. Why is this topic so important? You know something? It was important just now as we were leaving the musalla for the brothers. Because they kept the brothers in one place so the sisters could get out first. And it was amazing watching how impatient people were. We were just supposed to wait a little bit. It's not like someone's going to lock us in and say you can't leave the musalla for the next two years or anything. Just a few minutes until all the sisters leave. It was fantastic watching people. And it, uh, the most amazing people were the people, they see that we're not moving, but they're trying to push their way through. But where are you trying to go? Yeah, and you get to the door, so then you just stand there, must stand in your place. Yeah. And the most amazing thing was old people. You're like, I'll take care of this, and they keep push pushing everybody. Where are you going? So you, old or young, you're still going to stand at the door. And they just kept pushing their way through. Young kids, you know, and Somali is, mashallah, young but big also. Big guy pushing his way through, like, I'm like, I told one guy, like, good idea, just keep pushing your way through. You're probably going to get somewhere, yani. Impatience. Few people have patience these days. Ask yourself this, how many times do you push the button for the elevator? Huh? You pushed it one time and it lit up, right? When it lit up, what do you think now? You keep, again, yani what's going to happen? The button's going to say, oh, oh, you're pushing me? I'm sorry. Okay, let me bring the elevator. You push it one time, the light comes on, khalas. But... All of us, we push it more than once. Maybe it'll come faster or something. And that's not the mechanics of how it works, by the way. Uh, you know what? If you, if you drive, those of you who drive, when you're at a traffic light, it's a red light, when it turns green, 
And if you're a little bit delayed in moving your car, what happens? The guy behind you honks at you immediately. But next time do this. Calculate how many seconds you delayed moving your car. What do you think it'll be? It's probably like three or four seconds. So the light's green, you wait four seconds. Before you're done, the guy's honking you behind you. People are so impatient. So, uh, and actually I'll tell you a true story. I visited one country and the sheikh said that a man actually came to him and he said, Sheikh, give me a dua to help me become patient because I don't want to wait for it. <laughs> I mean, the guy says, I want to become patient, but I don't have the patience to wait for becoming patient. So give me a dua to quickly move things along. This is, a, this is the problem now. So why is it that people are not patient these days? Because of something called instant gratification. Instant gratification. Everything you want these days happens quickly. So you get used to instant gratification. Things happen very quickly. You know, before you would have to mail a letter and it goes to, you know, put the envelope into the post office and it gets mailed and they call it now snail mail because now we have email, electronic mail. And it just takes a few seconds and it can reach someone, across, you know, halfway across the world few seconds and you get your response quickly within a few minutes cell phone you want to call anybody anywhere anytime you pick up the phone and it you get a hold of that person and sometimes even while you're trying to call that person it takes a few seconds for the phone to connect and you get impatient like what is this just a few seconds you can't wait cars now you move quickly from one point to another planes again journeys that would have taken months just in a, in a few hours you're there you know so you don't have to wait for too many things. Fast food. Just a few minutes. You know, you make your order at the window. You know, give me two Angus burgers with uh, mushrooms and Swiss cheese. By the time you get to the window, it's ready. And you start chopping before you even get to the house. You one is gone. Everything is fast. So we get used to that. And not only that, not just uh, is everything quick and fast, but also whatever you want, you get it. You know, and those of us living here, you know, you, you wa whatever you want, you get it quickly. So if anyone now in this room is craving chocolate ice cream, how difficult would it be for you to get it? It's so easy. Just a few minutes, you could be eating it. So whatever you want, you get it. You know, you want to watch a certain movie or documentary, you can go wherever you go, either online or to a place, and you can get it. So whatever you want comes to you quickly. You don't have to wait for hours and for years. So most things happen quickly. And we're living now in a day and age, and we should be thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal, where most of the things you want are attainable, and you can get most of the things that you want. Most of the foods that you crave, what, whatever part of the globe it's from, you can find it here in North America. And whatever it is that you desire, you can, for the most part, afford it. If you want to buy a car, just one paycheck, you can buy, you know, some old car. In other countries, people work their whole life, and they can't get certain things. You know, I used to, uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a guy I knew, he was a professor in his country, and he used to get $7 a month. A professor, $7 a month. You know, some, a lot of us make more than that in an hour. So we're, we're, we're living in a, a day and age where most of the things are available and attainable. And you see, if you look at it, this has even affected the politics of the world now. Because before, politicians would always promise things for people. And that's why the politician would always say, if I'm elected into office, I'm, I promise you this and this and that. I'll promise you electricity in every home and running clear, uh, clean running water in every home and you know, health care for people and this and that. So now people have the health care, they have the electricity, they have the running water. So now politicians have nothing to promise people anymore. So what do politicians do now? They promise to save you from bad things. And that's why you always hear about you know, protecting people, uh, protecting the borders, terrorism. That's just a way, again, for these dirty, filthy politicians to, to get their way. Because before they used to promise people, but we're a day and age now where everything you want just about is there. The health care is there. So many blessings of Allah Azza wa are there. But most of the things are fast and instant. So we get used to instant gratification, things happening quickly. But you might ask then, if this is a blessing, then what's the problem with it? The problem is that this can transfer to other aspects of your life and it can transfer over to aspects of worship. And so when you want something from Allah Azza wa Jal, typically what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And then you're supposed to pick the times where your dua will be responded to. 
whether it's in your sujood or the last third of the night or when you're fasting and you break your fast, you're supposed to constantly, as the scholars say, beg Allah Azza wa Jal the same way that a child will beg their parent to buy them a candy or something like that at the store. The child will keep begging the parent you know, and, and crying over and over again just so they can get the candy. When you want something from Allah Azza wa Jal, you ask once and twice and you ask again and again and again. You keep crying and begging to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because we're used to things happening quickly, we want to, to raise our hand in du'a and we want it to, whatever we want to be there immediately with fries even, you know. Or, so we want things to happen quickly. And uh, we're supposed to, you know, put effort into it. And we're supposed to persevere constantly in asking Allah Azza wa for what we need. You know, how many of us right now, and don't put your hands up, but how many of us really will use the last third of the night to solve all our problems? How many people? Now, you just ask yourself, how many people use that as their way to solve problems? The last third of the night. So you prepare your clothes, you set your alarm clock, you go to bed early, and then you wake up in the last third of the night, and then you start to make dua to ask Allah Azza wa Jal. And why wouldn't you solve your problems this way? No matter what else you have to do during the day physically to solve your problem, make sure that one third of the last one third of the night is part of the solution. Because Allah Azza wa Jal subhanahu wa ta'ala in His greatness descends down to the lower heavens and He asks, Who will call upon me so I might answer? Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking this question. Who may call upon me so I may answer? Who will ask of me so I may give him? And who will seek my forgiveness so that I may forgive him? Subhanallah, every night this happens. Allah Azza wa Jal in His greatness is asking these questions. And what are we doing at that time? At that time we're in the deepest of sleep. People will have problems. And they'll stay up all night worrying about it. Then they'll go to bed and they'll wake up in the morning. And then try to fix it. But why didn't you wake up in the last third of the night? And ask Allah Azza wa Jal for a solution. So... And how difficult is that? Just set your alarm clock to the, you know, whatever time in the early morning and get up. And pray of whatever. It doesn't have to be a, you don't have to be a hafiz to just get up and pray in the last surah of the night. You can keep repeating one surah for an hour if you want. You can repeat surah al-qari'ah for a whole hour for one rak'ah. Just keep repeating surah al-qari'ah. What's the problem with that? You know, some of the sahaba, some of the early Muslims, the Prophet ﷺ, they're all narrations that they would recite one ayah for hours upon hours. Just get up and then make long ruku, long sujood. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you with your situation. So, can we all agree that this is part of our solution for the next time we have a problem? And those of us who have whatever kind of problem this time, can we make that a solution? Is it that difficult really? Allah Azza wa is asking. I always give the example, if the richest guy in Toronto comes and says, you know, look, you have problems, what monetary problem, just ask, say whatever amount I'll give you. You're like, wallahi, zatullah khair, ya khair. The total comes up to, long story short, $55,000. This is a guy that Allah provided for him. But Allah Azza wa in His greatness is asking, who may I ask so I may give him? And we're sleeping. So brothers, sisters, zatullah khair, make this part of your solution. For whatever problem you have currently, or for whatever problem you may have in the future. Wake up in the last third of the night. But you know what? Again, even in the last third of the night, it's not magic. You might have to wake up in, in the second day and in the third day and ask Allah Azza wa again and again. But in the world of instant gratification, we want even the dua to re be responded to quickly. And the thing is, you don't dictate when Allah Azza wa chooses to respond to you. That's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you wait and you constantly make dua and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَعْجَلْ The Prophet said that you will be answered to, you will be responded to your dua, so long as you don't rush. So then he asked him, how do you rush the dua? How do you rush? You say, I asked and I asked and I got nothing. So the Prophet said, you will be given the response as long as you don't rush it. So you'll be given the response as long as you don't say, I asked and I asked, I still didn't get anything. Then you won't be given anything. But you see how instant gratification can affect our dua? Everybody with me? Yeah? So, people are used to things happening quickly. And so now, they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't get an answer, they start to go and look for all other kinds of يعني, magical things, magical solutions. And that's why you have these weird books now that have a dua for everything. 
And the, and the, the book يعني, will promise things like if you say this, immediately this will happen. And if you say that, immediately that would happen. يعني, if you think there was a dua like that, there would be problems in the world. Anyone had the problems? Let me find that ridiculous book. Hey, hey, well, let me say this. Okay, great. Fine. Everything's fixed. You know, that's not how it is. We cry, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal, we persevere, we're persistent in asking Allah Azza wa Jal. But because of instant gratification, we want things to happen quickly. One example I always give is one formula, which is of course is false. All right? They tell you that anything you want to happen, if you recite Al-Fatiha 1,000 times at night, it will happen immediately. Anything you want. You know, brother is not married. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil uh, In the morning you'll be married. You know, it's of course, no need to say, this is, there's no such thing, there's no evidence to that, there's no hadith, it's just gibberish. And the good news is most people who attempt that, they fall asleep before finishing that. Maybe somebody can do the math, how long it takes to recite the Fatiha once, and then how many minutes, yani, times a thousand, is it even possible within one night? But people will believe things like that, they'll try it until they fall asleep. They'll try it. Why? Because they want these instant things, magical things. You know, if you go to the Muslim lands, if somebody has some kind of problem, wh what do they do? Where is one place they go? Who, who can tell us? One kind of person they go to. Huh, somebody said it, I think. The Sahir, yeah? Not, not a good sheikh. A sheikh, you know? A guy will go and he'll start the invocations, and something will come, a <laughs> big red thing will come out, and then... So, why? The, the jinn always going for these weird solutions and they'll give you a little bit of thing you you burn it and you put the ashes on top of your head and you climb and sit on top of a tree until it rains and then it will happen for you why because people want instant gratification they don't have patience for these kinds of things so now if you can't be patient with simple things like the elevator like the, you know the entrance is blocked for just a few minutes until the sisters you know move if you can't be patient while your sweet video game is loading, huh? How many of you young people cry when the video game is loading? Like, come on! <laughs> or do they load anymore? They probably don't load anymore. I don't know what's new with video games. They probably just go quickly. And you're still impatient, like, <sighs> two seconds? <laughs> because people are impatient. So if you're not even patient with the video game, the elevator, the just a few things like that, what makes you think you'll be patient with more difficult trials? And, and that's why this topic is so important because it's a pattern you know if it applies to just simple things it can move on to your acts of worship you know you might say well what's the big deal there's no punishment mentioned for impatience I mean, there's no hadith that says those who are impatient will get this punishment there's no ayah that says those who are impatient will get that punishment so what's the big deal well the big deal is that impatience especially when it comes to your deen it could lead to other, it could lead to disasters or it could lead to reactions that lead you to punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, well, for, we know that in Islam the places where patience is required. All right? And see now how important patience is. One of the things you have to be patient upon is obedience to Allah azza wa You have to be patient upon being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because obeying Allah requires patience. Because the, uh, how could you enter paradise without patience? And paradise has been surrounded with the makarih, things that are difficult or sometimes even, you know, you know, disliked for people. The paradise has been surrounded with things that are difficult. So you have to do the things that are difficult to make it into paradise. So if you're not a pat patient upon these things that are difficult, how are you going to make it there? For example, waking up for fajr. You know, you're, you're tired and you wake up for Fajr. Is that easier or is it easier to just wake up when the sun is out? That's easier when the sun is out. So you want Jannah, you do the more difficult thing. You get up and you wake up for Fajr because you want Jannah, hijab. That's the more difficult thing, no doubt. So you want Jannah, you'll do the more difficult thing. So you have to be patient upon the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody with me? Fantastic. Two. So one, you have to be patient upon obedience. Two, you have to be patient to stay away from the prohibitions, from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made haram, or prohibited, or unlawful. Because again, the hellfire was surrounded with desires. A lot of things that you desire, they've been, they surround the hellfire. 
And so, for example, is it what, what يعني, is it easier to just uh, you know commit most kinds of sins or to abstain yourself from the sin? To abstain is more difficult. It's easier to commit the sin. So a lot of times the things that lead to the helper are easy to do. You know, for example, يعني, fornication billah, committing zina, that's easier to do, especially in the West. It's very easy to do. So to keep yourself from that, you have to be patient upon this. You have to be patient up from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made haram. For example, having bad manners, is that easier? It's very easy. You know. And to be rude to people, that's very easy. So for the thugs in the audience, and I know that you're out there, the thugs in the audience, you are losers. I mean, that's the truth. Because you think you're fantastic for doing the easiest things. You think you're great for doing something easy, for being rude, you know, walking like this and stuff, and giving people the mean look and stuff. That's easy. That's easy. Anybody can do that. So you're, you th you're be you've become, quote-unquote, special by doing the easiest things. The more difficult things, to have good manners, be proper with everybody, contain your, you know, your anger and you know, watch your tongue around people. That's the easier thing. You know, using bad words. Is that easy or difficult? It's so easy. Anybody can pronounce a bad word. To contain yourself is more difficult. And most people, you know, whether religious or not, they throw out bad words. I just wait till situa in the masjid, alhamdulillah, just wait till he gets into an accident or something, bad words start flying out of his mouth. What is this? Oh, so you're a good brother when the sun is shining, huh? Not only when it's a good day, you're a good brother, yeah? But when stuff happens, <laughs> It's fantastic how the, some of these nice brothers, when something bad happens, they revert back into jahiliya. They just become some guy you've never met before, you know. Bad words, sign language, all kinds of me means of communication. And we ask Allah to not make us from that group say, Ameen. You know, speaking of bad words, they tell you that the person who uses bad words is somebody who has no patience. True or false? It's very clear. No one who has patience. Have you ever heard of a righteous man who has good patience? Something bad happened, said the F word? It doesn't happen. So if you use bad words, you don't have patience. If you use bad words, you don't have good manners. True or false? No doubt about that. No manners. If you use bad words, you also have no tawakkul. Because, you know, this is a situation decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now it happened and... You're not, you don't have any reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and immediately you start using foul language. And you also have no yaqeen. So now, you want to know what is one of the filthiest things ever? One of the filthiest things ever, what do you think? Think to yourself, don't say it out loud, but think to yourself. What do you think one of the filthiest things you could ever see or hear? I'll tell you. Sisters, pay attention. It's a sister who uses bad words. That is one of the most despicable things you'll see in your life. A Muslim sister, especially if she's wearing hijab, who uses the F word and the S word. And you might think now, well, why are you bringing this up now? You know what? I've been coming to this conference for a number of years now. And three years ago when I came to the conference, all right, let's be realistic now, yeah? Because, you know, sometimes we can deceive ourselves. Like, I remember one time they were like, oh, there, there's a thousand young men and women in the room right now listening to an Islamic lecture. MashaAllah. And the sun is rising from the west, and Islam is progressing and moving forward, and the light of Islam shall reach every household. A thousand young men in the room and women listening to a lecture on Islam. Okay, but let's not fool ourselves. There are, the estimate, as I was told from some prison chaplains in the Toronto area, the greater Toronto area, there are about 3,000 Muslim males in prison. And we're happy about a thousand who are here for a conference. Three thousand in the prisons. Let's be realistic. So being realistic three years ago, I was at this conference, and it was near a shopping center. And of course, a lot of shukansi was happening and stuff like that. Ilahi <laughs> ka'abso. So... So, uh, so what happened was that uh, some people weren't serious about the conference and now this is the complaint came from the owners of the shops in the shopping center. They came and complained to the organizers of the conference that the cis 
deters in hijab would hang around and loiter in front of their stores and when they would ask them to leave the sisters would respond with the F word hey, please <laughs> now even though it's pitch dark none of you are going to put your hands up why? and I know some people do use the F word but you won't put your hand up even though it's dark because you know it is so shameful and disgusting and you don't want your other sisters to know that you use bad words none of you are like <laughs> You know it. It's so disgusting and shameful, yet you are shamed in front of everybody, but in front of Allah Azza wa Jal, there you go, using the F word. Who do you think you are? Ja Rule or whoever it is, that guy? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, still it doesn't prove I was a DJ, by the way. Huh? <laughs> so, no, seriously, man, this is disgusting. A sister using the F word, and wearing hijab using the F word, these men, kuffar, Kuffar, Kuffar came to complain of Muslim sisters using the F word. What's with this Ummah? You telling me we're going to take over in Islam and the light of Islam? Oh, just put that aside. Don't give me any of that stuff right now. That's gibberish. Okay? You don't dream, Yani. This is the reality we have. Sisters in hijab using the F word. Kuffar males complaining from them. And you tell me Islam is going to... It's going to reach, but not from us. There must be another generation that's going to do that. Sisters, don't use bad words. Ever. Ever. Unbelievable. How can a sister use an F word? Or any other word for that matter? And that doesn't mean the brothers are off the hook. It's just unbelievable now. The other day I met this guy. Supposed to be religious. Met him at the masjid. Let's do coffee. So, okay, let's do coffee with this guy. He's sitting and the S word starts flying casually. No oops. I take it back. Sorry, I apologize. Just casually. Yeah, like we, me and him are always sitting over a beer or something. Why do I look like I have no beard and sitting in like a coffin around here? You using the S word in front of me like that? And this guy wants to talk about Islam and how Islam is going to move forward and da'wah for the sake of Allah. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to sit with you again. He's using the F word so casually. What do you think you are? No patience, for sure. I'm telling you people, don't use bad words. Don't. Yeah, this is unbelievable. Allah, yeah. I mean, maybe we should just... Not give a talk about patience and keep it about bad words. What do you think? All right. So, no, seriously, people. Yeah, I mean, so many brothers use bad words. And it's just very casual to them. And these bad words are being recorded. And you'll get them back. Don't worry. You'll get them back. You know, you don't have to take what I say seriously. Keep using bad words. Yeah, you're cool. Keep using bad words. Every time you use a bad word, the angel writes it down. And then you're going to get your chapters this thick of the F word, this thick of the S word, this thick, and just keep looking through it. Enjoy yourself. You don't have to listen to what I say. Nobody's going to stop you. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتْ If you have no hayat, do what you please. What does it mean? Scholars say there are two explanations. One means, if you don't have hayat, meaning you're not ashamed here, if you're not ashamed in front of Allah Azza wa Jal, you're not ashamed in front of people, and you're not ashamed in front of yourself. Am I ashamed in front of yourself? Yes. You're not ashamed in front of Allah, not ashamed in front of people, not ashamed in front of yourself. Fas not my shit. Do whatever you please. What does it mean? It means nothing's going to stop you. If you're not ashamed in front of Allah, not in front of people, what's going to stop you? But then the scholars say there's another meaning to the hadith. It means do as you please, and you will be punished for it. So those of you who are so cool now, you're going to continue using the F word, do as you please. And you will get it if Allah doesn't forgive you. So you better stop it right now. What is the value of saying I'm Muslim and I know the Quran and I know this and that and I went to this conference and I sat in this halaqa and I listened to that shaykh and I have this CD and in the end, your mouth, you're just like the kafir next to you who never heard of guidance, never heard of Islam, never heard of the Prophet wasallam. Don't do it. And it's not something hard to stop. And you know the man who came to the Prophet ﷺ and he complained. He said, I'm a Bedouin man. I've got the harshness of the Bedouins. So what do you suggest? And he give me a solution. The Prophet ﷺ tells him just three words and the man changed for the rest of his life. Why? Because he wanted to change. Three words changed him. So the Prophet ﷺ said, فَلَا تُسُبَّنَّ أَحَدًا Do not curse anyone. He said, I never cursed anyone after that, nor a camel, nor a sheep. Nor sheep, nor camel. He even added the animals to the list. You want to stop cursing, you can do it right now. It's not like you need to curse to survive. You're going to wake up out of breath. Oh, F. <laughs> you don't need it to survive. 
Sisters, don't you dare. Don't ever use bad words. Don't ever, you're representing Islam and using the F word or whatever other word. And brothers, who wants to marry sister uses the F word? Sisters, for information, nobody put their hand up. All right? All right, people. So you have to be patient upon what Allah made haram. Is it almost time or what? Okay. You have to be patient upon what Allah made haram because it's easy to use the bad words, it's easy to have bad manners, it's easy to do all these things. So you have to be patient upon that. All right. And then you have to be patient upon the trials and tribulations because no doubt everyone's going to have a different test in life. Some people will be tested severely, some people the test will be, you know, minor, but everyone's going to be tested. Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif Lam Mim, Ahasib al-Nas an yutraku an yaqulu amanna wa hum la yuftanun. Do people think that they're going to be left alone and they will not be tested? So what Allah is saying, yes, you're going to be tested. Everyone's going to be tested. So when Allah tests you, you have to be patient in order to pass the test. You have to be patient. And a lot of people, again, they are not patient. And they complain. So when you're tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have one of four possible responses. One, you can be patient. Then you get your reward for that. So that's the first one. That's where we all want to be. Allah tests you with something difficult. You're patient. Patient doesn't mean you don't do anything about it. You try to fix it, rectify it. But you're patient. You don't complain. You're not angry with Allah for testing you. The second type, if everyone paying attention. The second type, some people they get angry in their heart. But they still keep hold their tongue. They don't argue. They don't complain. And they don't complain to other people. They're just, in their heart, they're angry. And that's also not good. So you want to be accepting of what Allah tested you with. And th there's a third kind, people who complain. And they keep complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining about what happened to them. And then, of course, the fourth kind is the worst, where people like, uh, also will use uh, physically, uh, yani they'll uh, you know, like tear their clothing or tear their pockets or slap themselves, things like that. So, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, فَاصْبِرْ صَبْرًا جَمِيلًا Be patient, a beautiful patience. What does that mean? It means this is a patience where, you know, you don't complain and you're patient. Not one where you complain, and this usually happens with people when something bad happens to them. And I know I gave this example about three years ago, but I'll repeat it again. Where a calamity befalls someone and they complain to everyone and they think they're being patient. So just let's pick on sisters. Something bad will happen to a sister. So she'll get out her phone book and she'll call all her friends one by one. And then this happened and then the doctor said this and now they have to cut off his that. I'm out of ish. And then complain. And then in the end of the conversation, this is the beautiful part, she says, ah, what can we do? We'll be patient inshallah. <laughs> no. This is not the patience that Allah Azza asked for. Fasbir sabran jameel. And the beautiful patience is one where you don't complain. And then she hangs up, calls the next sister. And then he said that and then in the end, ah, we'll be patient. No. This, the beautiful patience is the one where you don't complain. You know, there was a, uh, uh, a woman uh, during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and some, someone had died, uh, some of her uh, and family had died and she was crying. The Prophet told her to be patient and she didn't recognize who he was so she said, you know, you don't know what this is like nor have you ever felt this type of يعني, calamity. So the Prophet walked away. So then later on they told her this was the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so, she came back to apologize to him. And the Prophet ﷺ told her, patience is required at the first shock. So when you first get the, the calamity, that's when you're patient. Not you cry for 10 years and then after all, khalas, we're going to be patient. That's not it. You know, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says that, like the, uh, the noble uh, person experiences or, or, or has patience willingly. Because he realizes the benefits of patience and knows the reward for his patience. Yani meaning, like someone who is a, a wise person, when he gets a calamity, something bad happens, he becomes patient immediately at that moment. Because later on it doesn't count. You know? So a, a wise man, as reported, a wise man said, a, a man with wisdom will, uh, as soon as he... Uh, as soon he f as he faces adversity... He, he does that which a foolish man will only do after a month. What does that mean? The foolish man, when he is tested with something difficult, 
It takes him a month to realize he has to be patient with this. First he's running around complaining and trying to do this and that. But after a month he realizes this, is, this just needs patience. But the wise man realizes it the first moment. Doesn't have to go through the month experience to realize that he has to be patient. It says that the, the person who is not very wise, he exercises patience only after he realizes that he has no other choice. And this is the person who is not wise. He will only become patient after realizing there's no other choice but to wait it out. A wise man realizes that from the beginning. All right. Uh, I'll tell you one time um, we, were, uh, we, were, we were sitting with this one, uh, one sheikh and then this guy came in and his car broke down and he had a flat tire and the spare was flat and so he was complaining. So the... Yeah, the Shaykh was trying to tell him, make dua. He's trying to tell him, say the dua of when you're afflicted with a calamity. You know? So he say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa khlif li khayran minha. So Allah, so we're, verily to, we're to Allah and to Him we return. So Allah, uh, give me reward in this, uh, for this calamity that has befallen me and replace me with something better. The Prophet says, if you say that dua, Allah will replace you with something better. So this guy came in with this problem and the sheikh kept trying to tell him to say the dua but he was too angry. No. Say after me, he just kept refusing. Then after a while they sat down and prayed duhur, we drank tea, the guy calmed down. He's like, sheikh, tell me that dua again. The sheikh said, it's too late. Too late. Now after you drink tea and you relax, now you want to say the dua you should have said in the beginning. So, anyway, so what happens with the patience? What do you get with patience? You get the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ That those who are patient, they get the reward without any, without measure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes will give us, you know, let's just call them mathematical equations for reward. You know, الْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا If you do the hasana, it's re multiplied times 10, and then it could be multiplied times 7, then multiplied by 100. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, with reward, no measure. No mathematical equation. Allah will give you the reward for your patience. So you get a lot of reward. But then there's something actually just as amazing. You get the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being a patient person. You get the love of Allah azza wa jal. And we know that because Allah azza wa jal says in the Quran, Wallahu yuhibbu sabirin And Allah loves those who are patient. Allah loves those who are patient. And in the end, as they say, it's all good, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ said that the believer... يعني, he said, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ the Wonderful is the, the lot of the believer. Because all of, everything that happens to him is good. So if something bad happens, if, if good happens, he's thankful, and then that is good for him. And if something bad happens to him, he becomes patient, and that is good for him as well. So every, whatever way you look at it, something bad happens to you, you can, it can be a win-win situation. If you're patient, it's, re it's good for you, it's reward. And if something good happens and you thank Allah, you still get reward. The Prophet said that is only for the believer, this great blessing here. So when you're tested with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you want to get an A or do you want to get an F? And if you want to get an F, go ahead and complain and be impatient. If you want to get an A, be patient and realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that whatever happened to you was going to happen 50,000 years before He even created the earth. You know, when you think of it like that, it makes things a lot easier to digest and to deal with. That this was written 50,000 years before the earth even existed. So why would you complain now? Things are going to happen. So you be patient and you get your reward. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى Verily after hardship comes ease. Not just once, again, next verse immediately, Allah Azza wa repeats it again, Inna ma'al usri yusra, after hardship comes ease. So, we know, even if you experience the hardship, you know that the ease is going to come, you know that you can call on Allah Azza wa you know that He is the most merciful, and you are patient, and you don't complain to others, and you don't come. Now, it doesn't mean that if, uh, you know, if someone can help you, or if you tell the problem to someone who can help you, and it means that you're complaining, and you're not being patient, but... When you complain, that's when you're being impatient. So with that, we stop here, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair for your attentive listening. Sallallahu alayhi wa barakatuh. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.